So in this video, we will try to uh, look at an explanation for why we need bias correction in ADIP, okay. Or in other words, I want to explain why do I do this particular step, why did I take MT and VT as it is, but why did I do this particular step which I had called as the bias correction step, okay. So note that uh, in the case of ADIM, if you look at this equation for MT, we are actually taking a running average of the gradients and storing it as empty, right? So this is the gradient and we are taking a running average or exponential running average of these uh, gradients, okay? Uh, exponentially decaying running average, right? Uh, so the reason we are doing that is that we do not want to rely on a single estimate. So we do not want to rely only on gradient of WT. We want to look at the overall behavior of the gradients over multiple time steps and then take a decision. So that means if one particular gradient at time t is actually pushing us in some direction. We do not want to be very hasty and start moving there. We want to accumulate the history and appropriately weigh everything in the history. That is the idea behind uh, uh, taking this uh, running average of gradients, okay. And the other way of looking at it is that we are interested in the expected value of the gradients and not the point estimate at time wt, right, at time t rather. So gradient of wt, which is this quantity, which is the point estimate at time t, we are not interested in that. We are interested in the expected value and our behavior should be according to the expected value. That is what we desire. So however, instead of computing the expected value of this quantity, which should have been ideal, we are computing MT as the exponentially moving average. So in the ideal case, we would want that these two quantities are the same, that the expected value of MT, the way I am computing it, and the expected value of the gradient of WT should be the same. If that is the same, then I am fine because then that means I am just uh, taking the expected value or the of the gradient instead of relying on the point estimate, okay. So let us see if that is indeed the case. So for convenience, we are going to just denote this gradient WT as GT because it is uh, cumbersome to write this grad symbol and it will just uh, uh, not make it so readable, the derivation that we are going to do. So I am just going to replace that as GT. So what I have written is GT here instead of grad WT. So from now on, I will just use uh, GT for grad WT, is that fine, okay. So, uh, <coughs> so we have this expression for MT. So now let us just try to expand it and see what happens, right. So at M0, it is going to be 0 because that is my starting point, so I have no history, nothing, so I will just going to keep it as 0. M1 is my first time step at which it is going to be beta into M0, so I have just substituted t minus 1 and t here at, in the original expression, I have just substituted appropriate quantities for uh, m of t minus 1 and g of t. So m of t minus 1 is 0, m0 and g of t is g1 and of course b0, m0 itself was 0. So what you will be left with is 1 minus beta g1. Now let us look at what happens is m2, m2 is going to be beta m1 plus 1 minus beta g2 but I already have an expression for m1, so I am just going to substitute that here and this is what I get, okay. Now let us look at M3, M3 is again going to be beta times M2 plus 1 minus beta times G3 and I have an expression for M2, so I am going to substitute that here and see if that leads to something interesting, right. So I have just substituted the value of M2 here, right and I already had the M3 part here, uh, the this term here as it is, okay. So now let us see, so this already starts looking something interesting, you see some pattern here. In particular, we could take these 1 minus beta terms outside, they can be taken common and then you will be left with beta square g1 plus uh, beta square g1 plus beta g2 plus g3. So let us try to write this more compactly, right. So I have taken 1 minus beta com common and then I have written the remaining terms as this particular summation and you can verify, right. So when i is equal to 1, this is going to be beta 3 minus 1 which is beta square into g1. When i is equal to 2, this is going to be beta 3 minus 2, which is going to be beta into g2. And when i is going to be 3, this is going to be beta raised to 3 minus 3, which is beta raised to 0, which is just 1 into g3, right. So we get back the same expression that we had here. Of course, there is a 1 minus beta outside. So this is a more compact way of writing it. And this was for the 3th entry, right. This was for m3, the third entry. Now what if uh, we want to write it for the tth entry in general? What if we want to write the expression for 
m t right. So, in general m t we can write it as 1 minus beta is i equal to 1 to t b beta t uh, beta raised to t minus i into g i right. So, this 3 is here I have just replaced them by t right you can just verify that this is uh, from you can just generalize from the third entry to the tth entry okay fine. So, now let us see we have the following expression we have simplified the expression for m t and written it more compactly. But what we are eventually interested in the expected value of m t right we wanted to show that certain things holds for the expected value of m t. So, just take expectation on both sides so this is what we will get okay. Now, 1 minus beta is of course a constant so I can move it outside the expectation. So, then I get an expectation of a sum. Now, the expectation of a sum is the same as the sum of expectations. So, I can write it as a sum of expectations okay. Now, again beta is a constant so I can take it outside the expect, uh, expectation. So, what I will be left with is beta raised to t minus i outside and expectation of g i right. So, this is actually expectation of g 1 when i equal to 1 then expectation of g 2 expectation of g 3 and so on okay. Now, we will make an assumption that all these g i's that means the gradient at time step 1, the gradient at time step 2, the gradient at time step 3 and so on they all come from the same distribution okay. We are going to make that assumption. So, let us try to understand the implication of that right. So, let us say this was the distribution from which g 1 came right. Suppose I am dealing with a scalar quantity and maybe this was the distribution from which g 1 came. Now, g 2 could have come from a different distribution, g 3 could have come from a different distribution and if that was the case then expectation of g 1 would be different from the expectation of g 2 and so on. So, what we have assumed to make things simple for us is that g 1, g 2, g 3 any g i comes from the same distribution and hence we can say that the expectation of all these g i's is going to be just the expectation of g that is this one single distribution from these which these entries come. This is of course a very uh, strong assumption but we are going to uh, live with this assumption okay. So, then this expectation of g i just becomes expectation of g. So, I have gotten rid of the index i that means I can move it outside the summation right. So, this is what I will get now these two have come out of the summation and inside I have this quantity. Now, let me just expand this, this quantity. This is nothing but beta raised to t minus 1 plus beta raised to t minus 2 plus so on at last you will reach t minus t which is just going to be beta raised to 0. So, this is nothing but a sum of a gp with common ratio beta and I can replace that sum by this formula. You know, this is the formula for the sum of a gp with common ratio beta. So, I have just replaced that and now what happens is this 1 minus beta and 1 minus beta cancel out. So, I get this particular expression that the expected value of m t is equal to the expected value of g into 1 minus beta t. So, I will just take 1 minus beta t on the other side and I can move it inside the expectation because it is a constant it does not matter. Uh, so, I will get as uh, oh actually yeah I can just move it inside. So, I will get it as expectation of m t over 1 minus beta is equal to expectation of g t right and this quantity the one which I have circled is nothing but m hat t right. This was exactly the bias correction that I was applying if I go back to the previous slide or the slide before that. So, this was exactly the bias correction that I was applying right. So, what I have inside is this. So, what I have shown is that if I apply the bias correction then the expected value of the bias corrected m t is equal to the expected value of the gradient and that is actually what I wanted. I wanted that whatever m t I am computing if I look at its expected value it should be the same as the expected value of my gradients and that is what I have arrived at right. Hence this bias correction makes sense and hence we apply this bias correction for Adam. So, this we have shown for m t we had a similar expression, uh, expression for v t right. So, for m t we had this bias correction as m hat t. And similarly for v t also we had this bias correction as v hat t. So, you can derive the same kind of uh, derivation for v t also and show that that bias correction makes sense right. So, this is an explanation for why you do bias correction in the case of Adam okay. So, we will end this lecture here okay thank you. Mm -hmm.